So good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you are. And, and welcome to today's eAxis webinar, the first of, of this year. Uh, and we start the year with a crucial question. What is the impact of climate change on the natural rate of interest? Uh, and this question is crucial, of course, for the development of financial markets and, and for the economy in general, but also it is also a key question that central banks should answer. Uh, indeed, uh, the natural rate of interest uh, is a central anchor for monetary policy and central bank must take it into account uh, for the implementation of their monetary policy stance. And the level of natural interest, uh, natural rate of interest matters greatly also for the, the policy space that central bank have or have not. It can strongly constrain this policy space or leave, it, leave more room for it. So to have a look at this question uh, today, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Wolfgang Pointner. Uh, Wolfgang is uh, an advisor at the economic department of the Österreichische Nationalbank, the UNB, the Central Bank of Austria. And uh, Wolfgang has been working on financial stability risk of climate change for a long time. He's actually one of, of the first central bank bankers I know that you that looked seriously at climate change for, for central banks some years ago already. And he significantly contributed to the ECB monetary policy strategy review on, on this issue. Uh, before joining the UNB, uh, Volgan was with the European Commission, the Austrian Ministry of Finance and Economic Concern for the Austrian Federal Council. Uh, Wolfgang holds a degree in economics from the University of Vienna. And before his research on climate change um, and financial risk for monetary policy, he worked on financial market regulation, innovation, innovative corporate funding, and, and financing condition for enterprise in Austria. So today, Wolfgang will present a critical survey of the impact of climate change on the natural interest or natural rate of interest and discuss uh, how the, the channel through which climate change can impact both positively and negatively this uh, interest rate and also the main model used to assess them. But um, before listening to Wolfgang, let me first take the temperature of the room uh, on this issue with our traditional poll. Uh, there are three questions today, uh, maybe a bit deep or difficult, so we don't know which answer is right or wrong, but uh, we'd be happy to get your, your views on these three questions. So we let uh, uh, a few minutes. And Volvo now, I hope that I, uh, that I introduced you in the right way and I, I didn't forget anything. Nothing at all. So the first two question about uh, the, 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 yeah, it's not the, so let's, maybe we can see the answer now, if enough people have answered. So the first question is, will the, upward pressure on uh, the natural rate of interest from the transition offset the downward pressure on productivity and growth. And the second question is, uh, will basically uh, physical risk increase or decrease uh, monetary policy space for central banks? And the third question is about uh, the transition risk, whether to increase or decrease monetary policy space for central banks. So first answer, yeah, very, it's a lot of yes, maybe or no, maybe, uh, whether it offset or not. Uh, I guess that you will not give an answer today, but uh, it's interesting to see that it's a bit of half half. The second, probably um, more frequent uh, weather event will decrease, maybe decrease the monetary policy space. And for the transition risk, it's also, half half between increase maybe or decrease maybe. So with that, uh, Wolfgang, the floor is yours. Uh, and let me just remind the audience that they can uh, ask questions in the question and answer box. And I will uh, relate this question later after your presentation. 
without okay. uh, prices. Thank you very much. Can you see the presentation now? Yes. Yeah, perfect. So um, thanks a lot uh, for the invitation, uh, having me today. And I wanted to say that this is what I'm going to present is joint work with Francesco Mondrelli from the ECB and Jan Willem van den Hen from the Dutch Central Bank. We started to work on the topic during the ECB's uh, review of its monetary policy strategy three years ago. And uh, this was a uh, a review that was conducted uh, very broadly and it has been the, the first review for a couple of years because uh, ECB and other central banks had a lot of other things to do before but uh, the climate change was a topic that was raised to these uh, strategic considerations of the ECB for the very first time so we were all quite interested in, in uh, participating and uh, analyzing how climate change would impact the monetary policy framework, but also the whole economy and then how central banks and monetary policy makers should react to that. And one of the um, interesting topics in within the review was uh, whether or how climate change would affect the natural rate of interest, which is a topic I'm going to talk today. Um, so let me begin with uh, giving you a bit of the flavor of the discussion that we had before. So we there is a lot of research that shows that uh, the natural rate of interest has been declining and this holds for different countries and different economic systems around the globe. So there's, for example, uh, uh, an occasional paper by the ECB authored by Klaus Brand and co-authors that gives a very good overview what are the driving forces behind this decline and they come up mostly with demographic, economic and uh, financial trends. And the point here is uh, since the uh, surveys or the papers that we are quoting here are, have been written five years ago or, or longer ago, uh, climate change doesn't feature very prominently or at all in these papers because climate change wasn't considered to be a topic that would have an impact on interest rates. And on the other hand, uh, generally these papers are like uh, economic service you tend to be, they are backward looking. So uh, if we talk today, and then uh, if I'm going to talk today about the impact of climate change on interest rates or on the natural rate, it is, of course, uh, with a forward looking manner, and therefore I will rely on, on many different scenarios. And then these scenarios have been built up uh, over the past years. So what we try in this paper is to show uh, whether there is a link between climate change, uh, transition policies, and then the risks to the financial system, to the financial system and the economic system. And, and uh, we try to uh, assess the, the impact from a survey that we conducted with the existing literature, but we also do apply um, well, some, some, we try to do some model simulations with the workhorse model of climate economics, which is the DICE model by William Nordhaus. And we tried to simulate different outcomes uh, that we consider the most important channels that how climate change could affect the uh, natural rate. So just to give you a brief overview, what we did was uh, we reviewed the economic and financial channels. And then, as I said before, the most important uh, are the demographic factors, changes in the productivity growth, then uh, the risk aversion and its effect on aggregate savings. And uh, of course, uh, in particular interest to us was the possible effects of endogenous monetary policy. Um, we then compared two different strands of modeling because uh, as, a central, as central bankers ourselves, we are mostly familiar with uh, the model families that are employed in central banks. But these models, as you will see later, do not feature prominently any climate variables. On the other hand, we know that the climate economy models, like for example, the before mentioned DICE model by William Nordhaus, uh, have uh, this particular nice feature that they combine the 
ecological trends and economic outcomes, but sometimes the, the modeling of economic relationships is not so detailed or granular as we as central bankers would, would want, want it to be. And, and uh, this will be visible to you when I show you the, the results of our simulations at the end of the presentation. So to start with, um, just let me try to get rid of, yeah. To start with um, the uh, overview, so the, uh, maybe some of you are not completely familiar with the uh, terminology that we use. So the natural rate of interest is the interest rate which uh, makes, uh, at which uh, aggregate demand equals potential output. And therefore um, the economy is in full employment and there is no upward or downward pressure on the price level. Therefore we also, that's what we call uh, price stability. And uh, this concept of the natural rate was first derived by Knut Wixell in the late 19th century, when uh, to him, uh, the interesting question was why actually in financial markets, uh, banks are charging uh, interest rates that differ from the natural rate. And so there, there was already there back then um, an interest in, in these uh, fi financial stability developments that uh, would lead to instability. So the natural rate in itself is a theoretical concept, which means we cannot observe it in the economy. But it is an important yardstick to policymakers. Uh, when central bankers, for example, are judging the monetary policy stance, they would have a concept uh, or an idea of where the natural rate is in the back of their head. And depending whether the actual policy rate is above or below the natural rate, uh, you would have a more uh, restrictive or an accommodative monetary policy. And uh, this is uh, the reason why the natural rate is of great importance to central banks, even though we do not measure it or we cannot measure it. But uh, what we do is we, we estimate it. And then of course it greatly depends what kind of economic model you use uh, for the outcome that you will find. So the natural rate or R star as it's sometimes called is defined according to the so-called Ramsey equation by uh, the changes in the population, which is the n term in this equation. And this is obvious because uh, if you have a expanding population, but your capital stock would be the same, then the uh, per capita capital stock would decline and, and therefore also the price of capital, which is the interest rate would change. And what we have seen so far over the last decades is that the decline in population growth has led to a decline in R star as well. And we've seen these developments uh, in the Euro area. It's well documented that, uh, for example, since the 1980s, uh, R star has basically declined by one percentage points according to uh, this study. But also in the United States, uh, we could see that uh, the demographic factors reduce the natural rate. And, but there again, uh, according to different models, you have uh, different uh, amounts of uh, outcome or differences in the decline. Um, so a very important question here is then how the demographic changes that we would expect for the future or that would that we would also expect to be triggered by climate change, would, which kind of impact they have on the natural rate. And so there are two different strands in the literature. One that says if we would see uh, the negative impact of, if we would see a negative impact of climate change on the demographic factors, which means that there would be less um, people in the employed, in employable age, and we would have an increase in the dependency ratio. So there are more retired people. And um, 
This means that these people, knowing that uh, they would, if they want to retire and they want to keep their level of uh, ink, uh, of consumption, they need to save more. You would have an increase in saving, and therefore um, the natural rate would decline because you had a more supply of savings, which would lead to a decline of the interest rate. On the other hand, um, good Charles Goodhart and co-authors argue that. Uh, if the demographic changes are as projected and you end up in let's say 20, 30 or 40 years from now with a population in which many, many more people are already retired, these elderly people would want to de-save because they would have saved up to the moment of retirement. Later on, they have to de-save. Therefore, um, then the aggregate savings rate goes down which would actually cause uh, upward pressure on our star. So here we see that the uh, net effect of climate change on the natural rate is ambiguous. Because um, on the one hand, we know that uh, climate change could lead to a development in which uh, life expectancy goes down. We know that, uh, for example, there could be an increase in very rare diseases, diseases, as we have seen a couple of months ago, the health conditions in general could decline. On the other hand, we don't know whether uh, the decline in living standards in other countries might cause migration flows. And if you have a huge inflow in uh, young productive labor, then uh, of course your labor force will increase. And, and But these effects, uh, you really cannot uh, predict with any degree of certainty or reliability, and therefore we we'll call this an ambiguous effect. So the next variable which determines uh, our star according to the Ramsey equation is total factor of productivity. And here we see that uh, if the total factor of productivity increases, which means that uh, future, in, in the future, you would have probably also higher income because your productivity would increase and your wages would go up again. Then you uh, would probably uh, have uh, less incentive to save. Whereas on the other hand, if, your producti if productivity is expected to decline, then probably you would save more today because you know that your future income will be lower and, and because you want to have a rather smooth consumption profile over time, then therefore you would uh, increase saving. And here uh, the expectation is that uh, it's, it's again, it's a bit ambiguous because there in the literature, you would find people who would argue in favor of uh, climate change decreasing productivity and others would argue that climate change and the investments that are necessitated by climate change and the investments that we need to have a proper transition to a low carbon economy these would uh, actually increase productivity. So if, if you compare the economic literature or papers and, that have been published so far, you see that um, if we have a higher demand for investment in the area of climate change mitigation, climate change adaption, uh, this not necessarily increases our economic productivity. Because uh, so far, when we talk about uh, productivity enhancing investment, we talk about innovation that make it possible to produce more output with the same inputs as today, or to, to even re um, reduce inputs and then keep the level of output. But this is not necessarily the case for climate change mitigation investments. Uh, the same holds, um, for example, if you think about the depreciation of capital that would come with a higher, uh, more frequent weather, uh, negative weather shocks or rising sea level and stuff like that. So um, if, if, for example, you live in an area where uh, increase, uh, the, the number of storms and heavy rainfall increases over time, 
uh, your capital probably has a higher rate of depreciation or you need more capital for repair and uh, replacement investments. But these uh, repair investments do not make your capital stock in itself more productive. It's just uh, that your demand for capital will increase, but it's not necessarily the productivity rate that increases. On the other hand, we, there is a whole strand of literature that uh, can be summarized uh, under the name of the so-called Porter hypothesis that says if we um, invest heavily into the green innovations that we would need for the transition, then there might be some uh, creative destruction processes a la Schumpeter or just because we bring together a lot of smart scientists that develop some climate technologies, they will also accidentally produce some innovative spill-offs, spillovers, some new technologies uh, that can be used for completely different purposes. And therefore you will have a higher rate of productivity. But um, so far empirically, you cannot really find any evidence for the Porter hypothesis. Um, Okay, so about the productivity gains or losses I've been talking. Yes, so again, here we see that the impact is rather uh, ambiguous. We, we cannot say for sure, but from our reading of the literature, we would expect that uh, the negative impact outweighs positive impacts. So, um, what uh, the next thing uh, that will be influenced by climate change is the risk aversion. And the risk aversion in the Ramsey equation is captured by two variables. That is on the one hand, the smoothing preference gamma and the time preference rho. And the smoothing uh, preference gamma relates, uh, basically it is the sensitivity of your income changes with respect to the interest rate. And it says that if, uh, because you, uh, because we expect people uh, want to have a rather smooth uh, consumption profile over time, if they would expect uh, some major shocks to their future income, be it positive or negative, they would uh, adjust the current income levels and they would adjust also current uh, saving demand. And uh, the time preference just tells you whether you want to consume more now or in the future. So this is kind of uh, just like whether you're patient or not. And if of course uh, you are uh, less patient, you would consume more today. And if you are more patient, you would uh, have higher savings today. And, and here is also the question whether climate change has an impact on these two variables. So what we know from uh, the literature and then also from all these scenarios that have been conducted by the IPCC and other uh, natural scientists, uh, the effect of climate change will be that uh, there's a high uh, increase in uncertainty and so-called fat tail risks will also increase. And therefore, um, it would make sense from a per perspective of a rational uh, consumer to uh, increase savings. Uh, and it's also the question of whether the rational investors will change their investment behavior in a sense that uh, since future returns to investment are more uncertain, they could reduce uh, investment and then uh, try to consume more today. Or if they really want to keep their uh, consumption profile for the future very high, they would have to invest even more. And uh, both of these developments also probably lead to the uh, fact that we will see a higher demand for safe assets, which again is of course a huge issue for us here in Europe because uh, safe assets usually you would think of as government bonds and the uh, safety of government bonds has been discussed uh, in Europe uh, because not all uh, government bonds or not all bonds of all governments are equally safe. So uh, when we look into the empirical finance literature, we find that uh, even today, some authors uh, find that investors do actually already now ask for a risk premium for different uh, assets with when assets differ with respect to their climate change risks. 
So there um, is, for example, this um, analysis by Bolton and Kapatrick, where they look into the American stock market. And what they find is that uh, stocks that have, uh, for example, more uh, carbon emissions that are related to economic activities with higher carbon emissions, uh, the, the investors would typically ask for a higher return on that kind of stock so that it actually dampens the price of that stock. And also uh, Stefano Battiston and Irene Monasterolo did uh, analysis of the for the bond market and what they find is that uh, in uh, also bonds for company bonds of companies uh, with higher exposure to climate risk uh, have to pay higher yields so uh, this brings me to the framework for our analysis and uh, maybe before I mention, before I go into the modeling details, which were actually not very detailed, but uh, before I start with that, uh, what we did not cover fully in our paper is, of course, the question uh, whether climate change increases inequality, because we know that um, from inequality, there is also um, impact on our star in the sense that there are some papers which have tried to explain the decline in our star over the recent uh, past with uh, the increase in inequality. And then also, so this whole uh, strand of the literature we did not cover very well. So therefore, I, I, but I just wanted to mention it. So it, it's, we are aware, well aware that these channels do exist. So when we, and uh, I wanted to pr present here the two types of economic models that are used in the analysis or the determination of our star, because you can see that they, they differ and they take different um, variables into account. So starting with the uh, typical central bank model, uh, you can see here the uh, Laubach-Williams model, for example, and that's just a present re representation of a whole bunch of different economic models. Our star would be determined by the uh, growth rate and uh, a factor Z, which captures basically all different types of, of uh, reasons for, um, for risk aversion and so if, if we start on the left upper hand corner, uh, you see that the monetary policy maker takes a particular decision. And here we assume that this decision has an impact on economic and financial trends. This is a quite uh, a new assumption, you might think, because if, if one of you has taken an economics course any time in the past, let's say 10 years ago or longer ago, you might have heard that money is always neutral and therefore there cannot be any impact of monetary policy on long-term economic trends. But since um, there has, since I would say, let's say over the last 10 to 20 years, there have been some major innovations and new insights. And now we think that actually there is a possibility that uh, the uh, endogenous the monetary policy can have uh, endogenous effects on uh, our star, and and so if if these uh, financial trends then affect the potential output of the economy, of course the uh, potential output growth, which is captured by G here in this model, will also change and. Uh, the decisions by the rational consumers or the firms in the model, which are also determined by their risk aversion or their time preference, which as I said before, is captured in the factor Z, all together then will determine the natural rate. And then this natural rate uh, is the yardstick for monetary policy in a sense that whenever the monetary policy, policy maker thinks that uh, its current policy rate is below the natural rate, it would have an incentive to increase uh, policy rates. So um, as, we, as I think I mentioned already, these central bank models, uh, think of a typical new Keynesian model, think of a DSG model, whatever. These models are uh, 
calibrated or estimated based on historical data, which means they are backward looking. They usually have a rather short time horizon because for the policymaker, it's always important, uh, for a monetary policymaker, it is important whether, um, let's say his key variable, the price level or the, the inflation rate for the next three years will be within uh, his target range. Therefore, these models have a typical horizon of up to three years. And, and, and they do not take into account typically the uh, effects of climate change, nor do they have a very well-developed representation of the energy sector. I think this is something that you see that we, we wrote the paper like one year ago. And I think the, exactly the last point on the slide, this is something that is changing now very rapidly because uh, since um, the energy crisis of 22, uh, many central banks are trying to develop new models with a very well-developed energy sector. So um, yeah, here you just see what I've said before that now we know, or we think we know that uh, our star can be endogenously affected by monetary policy. Uh, this is mostly through the impact on productivity. Uh, you might have heard of the hyster hysteresis effect, which means that, uh, if uh, the economy runs below potential for too long a time, then uh, the potential level itself will decline because some if people are unemployed for too long a time, then their skills uh, have depreciated and their productivity goes down. And then this is one of the many ways to explain this uh, phenomenon. So, Another uh, thing that has been discussed, and, and, and uh, Pierre has been part of that discussion many times, is whether the uh, monetary policy authority affects uh, the capital allocation within the economy, and therefore also uh, the allocation of brown and green assets. And this is something that, that came to a particular prominence due to um, the asset purchase programs that many central banks have conducted over the last years. And so what we see here is that, uh, and there has been a criticism that uh, central banks very often bought uh, carbon emission intensive uh, assets, that means assets from companies or from sectors that emit a lot of carbon dioxide. And that's true, especially if you compare the uh, emission level uh, in the monetary policy portfolio to the emission uh, in the economy on average. And the reason the, uh, for that is that we usually uh, that, that central banks uh, in their asset purchase programs usually bought uh, bonds and bonds are issued in uh, very high numbers by capital intensive industries. And these capital intensive industries tend to be on the brown side of the economy. So typically your, your hairdresser is not very carbon intensive, but your hairdresser is also uh, very rarely in a position to issue a bond. And therefore the uh, monetary policy portfolios have been biased away in, in towards the, um, more carbon intensive sectors and industries. And this is something we are aware of. And then and, and there has been a debate whether the um, future purchases should be tilted towards the more greenish assets. And then I think the, those of you who live in uh, Europe have uh, probably heard that several very prominent monetary policy makers within the Euro area have already voiced uh, their ideas about this tilting process. And I think this is something that uh, these people are considering very seriously. Um, another issue also very much related to the discussion that we are currently having here in Europe is whether or not the, any investor could actually judge whether assets are green or brown because uh, a priori, you, if, if you don't know anything about the industry or the sector, if you just know the company's name, it's very difficult to charge uh, whether it is uh, carbon intensive or not. And therefore there has been um, a movement now at the, policy, at the European policy level that companies and corporations should in, 
disclose the carbon intensity of their production, especially uh, corporations and companies that are above a particular threshold in terms of capital and employment. So these big companies that are also very likely to issue bonds or stocks. And then therefore the disclosure is of high relevance to the uh, financial market participants. So in comparison to what we've seen before about the monetary policy model, what you see here is a typical climate economy model. And uh, so this is very much based on the DICE model by William Nordhaus, which I, I said already before we did some simulations with, uh, which will I will present at the end of this uh, presentation. So what is the whole idea of this type of model, you have some kind of uh, idea about the social cost of carbon. You know that uh, emitting carbon and other greenhouse gases causes damages and then these damages should be priced. So you can think of, think of the social cost of carbon as your carbon tax. And then this uh, price or this social cost of carbon, once it's implemented, it leads to a kind of abatement. So the, you change the behavior of the uh, firms and therefore you also change the output of the firm. So there's a different output after abatement. And given that particular output, you have still some emissions and these emissions, uh, it, then you need some natural scientists who can explain uh, model how the carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions impact uh, the climate and then change the temperature. And these temperature changes or the new temperature then goes into the damage function. This is basically the, the, the heart or the centerpiece of this kind of model. So you have a damage function that relates the increase in temperature into economic damages that reduce your output, your capital, all the other variables. And then you have an output after the damages. And again, here, this uh, output after damages determines your per capita consumption growth, your future economic growth. It also determines uh, the decisions of the individuals, of the households and the firms. It changes possibly their risk aversion and their time preference. And that again leads to the equilibrium interest rate, the, uh, sorry, the, the natural or the, or the natural rate. So we use that uh, interchangeably. So this changes our star and then again, from a change in, in our star, you can have a change in the social cost of carbon. Um, so this is what sometimes the point here is that uh, these models typically do not have a variable that is called the natural rate of interest or the equilibrium interest rate. They, what they do have is a discount rate. They have a a proxy for risk aversion and, and because they also do have kind of, uh, they, they do model a household's consumption decisions and therefore they also need a time preference variable. So you do have all the ingredients that you need to calculate the natural rate yourself, but uh, typically it's not part of the standard set of variables in the model. Um, here again, in, in contrast to the, um, to the models of central banks, the whole uh, economic system is uh, very simply, very much simplified. And so, <clears throat> yeah. So what we did, and this is uh, the last part of my presentation, and I, I guess I have to speed up a bit. So what we did now was uh, we, we used this DICE model and uh, try to simulate different effects of climate change on the natural rate within that model framework. You, you have all the variables, as I have mentioned before, you have a uh, COP Douglas production function, you have the damage function. And so let's tr jump right into the simulations. What you see here is, uh, First, we try just to assess the impact of the changes in temperature without uh, changing any of the uh, economic parameters of the model, just assuming uh, different temperatures that go along with the IPCC scenarios that are also known as the shared socioeconomic pathways. 
so you have different temperature. And what you can see here is, and then you know that, uh, so the SSP5 uh, would basically bring about a temperature increase by the end of this century of more than four degrees Celsius, which is really, really horrific. And, and nobody wants to be there. But what you can see in terms of uh, our star, the impact is rather negligible because uh, the, graph, uh, the graph shows you uh, the changes or the deviation from the initial level of our star in the year 2020. And then we move ahead in five year steps. And you can see that by the end of the century, uh, even if you have the highest increase in temperatures imaginable, the uh, natural rate of interest would be just like uh, three point three percentage points lower than in the most benign outcome. So basically, we, we don't see much of an impact here. So the next thing uh, we tried is to, to model uh, changes in risk aversion. So uh, I, I already explained before what the parameter gamma is. And here, we uh, this is the sensitivity of changes in income to uh, and uh, how they affect the uh, equilibrium or natural interest rate. And what you can see here is we assume that there's a, a permanent shock into the income growth rate. Uh, so it's reduced by half of a half a percentage point, and then we we played around with different sensitivity parameter gamma, which is the the risk aversion, and so you can see that typically, um, so in 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 the dice model, the baseline scenario is a gamma parameter of one point four. We have uh, found in most uh, DSP models for the urea uh, gamma of one. And then we, we tried much higher values. And then here you can see that if the risk aversion goes up very strongly, if, if, if people really, really uh, want to keep the uh, consumption path smooth, but the, they expect um, for whatever reason that climate change will be so strong or so they, that their risk aversion goes up very strong, you can see that this could have really, really uh, strong effects on the natural rate. So we're talking here about a decline of, of, of three percentage points or 300 basis points, which is quite something. And in um, this simulation, we uh, assume that there will be a change or a shock to the productivity rate. And as I've explained to you before, we do not know at, in advance whether the shock will be positive or negative. Therefore, we, we, we simulated both varieties of shocks. And, and just to give you a flavor of how this is done in the DICE model, the DICE model in itself has a declining total factor productivity growth rate. And so you can see here that the total factor productivity A is declining with this decline rate AGD. And uh, the um, baseline scenario within the DICE model framework is that this uh, risk, uh, that, that the take total factor productivity will decline by half a percent, half a percent uh, every five years. And we reduced that by half. And we also tripled it. So you can see that you have a, a, a decline rate of 1.5% or one of just a quarter of a percent. And what you can see here is that uh, also the, especially the increase in the decline rate, which means that if we assume that uh, climate change has a negative impact on total factor productivity, that uh, all the investments that are necessary to mitigate or all the replacement investments are not, um, increasing productivity, but de uh, just declining it, or just that they are uh, crowding out the more product productivity enhancing investments, and therefore we have a decline in productivity, then uh, this would also lead to a much lower uh, R star. And then finally, I think this is a particular interesting uh, simulation because it, it says more about the, the model itself than about uh, our rational expectation of our star. And here we change the damage function. The one thing is that, um, so how uh, do the uh, damages, how, how does the increase in temperature 
affect economic output. This is the damage function. And you can see on the upper right side, the damage function is uh, a function of temperature. And in the baseline of uh, the dye specification, the parameter, the, the exponent A3 is two, which means you have a quadratic relationship. And just for the sake of the argument, we increase that to five, which you might think, okay, this is completely unrealistic. What is the foundation for this change? How do you, uh, you are not a natural, I'm, it's true, I'm not a natural scientist. I'm not the person you would turn to if you wanna know what is the impact of higher temperatures to economic outcomes whatsoever, because that's not my field of expertise. But we know that, um, Climate change is likely to cause tipping points. And tipping points are modeled typically as non-linear relationships. And then therefore we chose uh, the parameter A3 to equal five, because you can see that this uh, is almost as if there is a particular threshold after which climate change really, really devastates the economy. And then you can see this in the right-hand panel down in the graph. The right-hand panel shows you what is the damage fraction as percent of output if we assume that uh, higher um, exponent for the damage function. And you can see that by the end of the century, you have a damage fraction, which is the fraction that is damaged by climate change in each year of almost 10% of GDP. Of, of output and and that's really quite significant you, you must like this is uh for all of the we i should have mentioned before we, we we did all our simulations based on euro area data so this is like say the euro area and the output in the euro area is damaged by climate change each year by 10 percent at the end of the century and then in the left panel of the graph you can see what would uh, the impact of that scenario be on our star and you can see it's 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 fairly small so you have this totally devastated economy and you have just a decline a decrease in our star by let's say 0.3% that seems a bit unrealistic if you ask me so and then, of course, you, then also you, you can combine different shocks, and I'm not going into detail here because uh, this is just for the sake of the argument. Uh, let me conclude before I take some, some questions from the audience. So what we see is that the downward effects of climate change on our start can be substantial according to these model simulations. And especially uh, if we consider that there's this large uncertainty around the outcomes and that uh, households and firms uh, both will probably, uh, given these high degree of uncertainty, uh, increase precautionary savings. So that, that's uh, very likely. Um, if there are climate related innovations and, and, and more investment, this could have an upward effect on our star, true. Especially uh, even if, as I said before, even if the, um, innovations are not productive, if even if the investments are not productivity enhancing, there's still an upward effect on our star because you have a higher demand for capital. And in capital markets that drives up the interest rate. But um, I should have mentioned before, there is a, a rather new literature, which I found pretty interesting, where um, Deschel Pretre and others from the LSE analyze the uh, content of green innovations. And then what they find is that they, green innovations lead to extreme, uh, to, to very uh, strong increase in patents, which is good. But on the other hand, that these patents and the activities that are patented are, are not increasing productivity in the firms that uh, develop these patents. So that's rather negative. Um, of course, all these effects depend on the transition policy path. Yes, um, so you know that that if your policy, if the national or European policymakers would decide that we want to invest more in, cl in climate change mitigation or we invest less because we, we ignore climate change, then of course you have diff very very uh, huge differences in the outcomes. And uh, so our conclusion, and this is what 
why we did the whole uh, research exercise in the first place, our conclusion would be that uh, there's a higher probability that the policy space for central banks will be reduced by climate change, since um, most um, of the effects that we have considered are rather dampening our star and not increasing. And my last point is, and I think that's especially of, of relevance for a monetary union like the euro area, where you have one currency but different fiscal authorities. Um, but let's say it's also for the US of, 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 of some relevance. If you think of, of, of uh, large countries, uh, they probably will face the effects of climate change in different regions, in different intensity. So you can think, uh, we, you could have a, a year in which you have devastating wildfires in Spain. And at the same time in, in the Netherlands, they have a very good harvest. Or you have, a, I mean, you know what I mean. So basically there are very huge differences. You have a positive shock in one country and a negative shock in the other country due to climate change. And why is this of, of relevance to us as, as central bankers? Because we have in Europe, we have only this one instrument, we have only one monetary policy for different countries. And so here, a lot of the um, adjustment costs that are necessary will lie with the national governments. Okay, I think I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm, I'm ready to answer questions if I can. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Um, so we have a few minutes left for uh, questions. So please feel free to ask them in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> maybe to start, um, there were some questions during the presentation about um, how, what are the link basically between the natural rate of interest and uh, the social cost of carbon? Is it one-on-one -on -one link? Um, uh, and I would add on my side also what is the link between the natural interest rate and uh, the interest rate that you see on, on financial market. And uh, does that really, you know, do they, do they coincide or, or where do you see the links there? Okay, uh, so for the first question, I think that the, the link is mostly due to the fact that uh, all the um, investments that are necessary to reduce uh, climate change or the effects of climate change uh, are, of course, uh, under the, uh, they, they, they have some financing cost, and these financing costs are influenced by the natural rate. And therefore, uh, if you want to, um, let's say, all these carbon sequestering ideas or that you need a uh, to finance the infrastructure for e-mobility and, and all the other instruments of, of, uh, carb, of climate policy that might come to mind. They are all under the uh, financing constraints and these financing constraints are heavily influenced by the natural rate. That's for, and then the other thing, uh, yeah, the natural, the, the natural rate and the rates that you see in financial markets, they, they differ very often. And then, but this is, and finally, this brings us back to the very original idea by Knut Pixel that he says, okay, that sometimes you have some developments in financial markets that competition among banks or some financial innovations would lead to a deviation from the natural rate. And this um, would then cause some, uh, how do they call it? Uber invest like like so so you you basically could explain these boom and bust cycles that were typical for the late 19th century and then this is uh, the thing that he tried to explain with uh, this concept and I think that that's not um, yeah in a way it is related to what we see now I mean for us as I said before as central bankers uh, the natural rate. Although we, we do not know it, I mean, I, if you ask me, I cannot tell you what is the natural rate for the euro year because I, as I, said, I can't observe it. I, I can have an estimate, but uh, that could differ from your estimate, and it could also differ from the estimate of Madame Lagarde. I mean, so, but but uh, this is the the yardstick which we compare our policy rates to. So if, if I would think that the natural rate is 2% and uh, now the policy rate is at 3%, maybe we are, this means we are restrictive and maybe we want to be restrictive because we want to dampen inflation. So that makes sense. But uh, so uh, these two, the, the concepts are separate, but uh, we use the natural rate always to, to charge 
policy rates and also a financial market rate, whether they are too high or yeah. too low. Maybe one one question on that: What I mean, if if um, the natural rate of interest is somehow linked also on what you know you observe from fundamentally on financial market, um, <clears throat> what disrupt financial market is rather short and uh, like large changes in the interest rate. And one way um, where that could happen is by changing the risk preferences, by, by changing the, in the, in the risk perception as well. Uh, so you show in the beginning that you know uh, there is a premium for, for let's say, brown investment that, that seems to appear on the market. The question is whether this reflects totally the, 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 um, the increase in risks. That we, that, that we observe. So basically, are risk priced fully? Because that could be a trigger of quite abstract, abstract change. So well, where do you, where do people stand on that? If you, yeah. if you have some answer. No, no, that, that's a very valid question because uh, what we also see is that these, I mean, we do not see these uh, risk premia in all financial markets. What, what uh, Bolton and others find for the US stock market, there is another paper by Stephen Ongenia and uh, co-authors on large syndicated loans, and uh, they find a positive risk premium effect after 2015, which they interpret as since the Paris Accord, uh, people are more aware, and therefore they now charge you some higher risk premium for climate sensitive uh, risks. But then, of course, the question is, how does this risk premium relate to the social cost of carbon? Because if, if I charge you a risk premium of 0.2 percentage points, you're fine. I mean, of course, it makes your loans more expensive, but maybe the r real rate I, I should charge you is like 500 basis points more. And then this is something that uh, I think nobody could answer at the moment. At least I'm not familiar that there is any literature that would, could give you a precise estimate of how would um, the incorporation of the social cost of carbon and the full amount of climate related risk really drive up interest rates in the markets. I haven't seen that. That's, that's something that a lot of people are, are after, including in the financial yeah. market. Um, one question relative to the, probably the, also the, the impact of climate change on, on health, health costs in the, mm -hmm. in the economy. Um, did, you, did you also um, kind of simulate that at one point? Or do you have a sense of how big this, this could be compared to, to what you, you observed? No, no, we, we did not simulate that. And, and that is related to the fact that, uh, I don't know whether I made myself clear, but when we... Um, when we screened the literature on the effects or the relation between uh, the two demographics and the natural rate, it was very inconclusive. So you have arguments in favor of uh, changes in demographics, even changes caused by climate change would drive up the natural rate or they would dampen the natural rate. And therefore, so we had no idea where to start and therefore we completely excluded that kind of scenarios from our simulation. But uh, yeah, so the, the, I think just to repeat myself a bit, the, the one thing is that if, if, if climate change leads to higher temperatures, the, which is uh, unhealthy for many people in many regions, you would have a negative effect on um, demographics and therefore a dampening effect on our star. And on the other hand, exactly that could cause, uh, and that's some authors, some authors argue that that might cause migration. And if you have migration, then of course you, you can imagine a scenario where you have inward migration of young, highly skilled migrants, and that would drive up our star rate. But uh, you don't know. And and so the literature, and I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on migration, but the literature that I saw was, especially with respect to climate change induced migration. First of all, um, if you have a local climate change induced disaster people would move 
to the next village or the next region within their country. So it's not necessary. Many times uh, there are studies for uh, Asian countries and Latin American countries. If there is a negative, if something happens at the coastline, people move in inwards uh, their country. And, and once that disaster has been removed, they, they come back to their old village or their own town. But now probably we have to think a bit bigger and if, if whole regions are devastated and you cannot go there again, it's really difficult to answer whether people will stay within the country still and then and, and try to find a living in another town there. Or, or the, yeah. And then and the last point, what we can see is that most of these climate related damages, they they reduce the liquidity within the affected region. And therefore, I guess the uh, people have less the opportunity to, to migrate from, I don't know, Indonesia to France. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, that's, an, uh, I mean, there are many, many aspects. I just wanted to highlight one that you also highlighted in the beginning, which is the impact of inequality on the, on the interest rate. So we have, we have that higher inequality tend to decrease interest rate, or at least you have some, some theory for that. And, and I don't know if you've seen also for the audience, there was a report published uh, recently by um, the, the World Inequality uh, Database or something that were linking, um, you know, the distribution of costs uh, of, the, of climate change. Um, and it's highly skewed that the costs are highly skewed to other people that have also less uh, resources. So yeah. increasing inequality, which could again have an indirect impact just for me to, to highlight this link, link again. So we 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 are at the end of this uh, this uh, webinar. Let me just um, flag to our audience that, that our next uh, webinar will we will have Jean-Paul Rennes who will present his paper on climate linkers, uh, rationale and pricing. Uh, and you will find all the information you need on, on our webpage. Uh, Wolfgang, thank you uh, again for this presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed it as much as, as we did. And uh, yeah, to all the audience, uh, um, let me wish you a good end of day and week and until the, the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Pierre. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.